Tihe e mauri ora, ki te rangi tū nei, ki te papa i tāko tō nei, tēnā korua. Kia rātou ngā wairua whakaruru hau, koutou ko wehe, koutou e noho mai nei, hei arahi, hei tiaki, hei tātou, hei unga ora, tēnā koutou. Ki te whare e tū nei, tēnā koe. Me mihi, mahana ki a koutou katoa, me ngā kaimahi, tēnā koutou. A me mihi ki te kaupapo te rangi e hui hui nei, i a tātou, hei hunga ora, mauri ora ki a tātou. Ko taratara te maunga, ko whangaro te moana, ko mamaru te waka, ko ngā puhi te iwi, ko ngā te kahu ki whangaro te hapu, ko waihapu te marae, ko te rena tuku ngoa. Nō roto roa ahau. Get into it then, eh? What does normal mean to you? To be honest, I hate that word. Our whānau used to be normal, or what some people would classify as normal, but it all changed in an instant. And one morning, our lives were flipped upside down and we began the journey of our new normal. I remember walking into the hospital as if it was yesterday. It was just after midnight, the corridors were dark and there was a sense of foreboding in the air. We made our way towards ICU, not really knowing what to expect. We found my mum alone in the waiting room. She tried to be strong for us, but when we looked into her eyes, we could see that she was shattered. She told us the prognosis wasn't good and the doctor said if he was likely to survive, then he'd be a vegetable and spoon fed for the rest of his life. At that moment, I could see the weight of the world on her shoulders. So as my sister and I made our way down to ICU to see him, we paused at the doors. Now there were only a set of doors, but for us in that moment, they look like doors are about to shatter our world. I remember looking over to her. <laughs> and taking a deep breath before we went in. The doors opened and there he was. Our beautiful brother lay peacefully in a silent room where you could hear where the machines keeping him alive. Now we didn't understand what the doctors were talking about because to us he looked perfectly fine. But despite what he looked like on the outside, the real injury was unseen. It was called a traumatic brain injury. And what does that even mean to a 16 year old? Like I said, in my eyes, he looked fine on the outside. So no one sat us down and explained the process of what may occur with a head injury or what to expect when he opened his eyes. So have any of you seen a movie where someone's had a traumatic brain injury, uh, they've woken up from an induced coma from about two weeks in the movies? So they tend to lie there, open their eyes, look around the room days and say, where am I? Well in my naivety I thought that's exactly what we were waiting for. All he had to do was open his eyes. Well, as you would probably know, that didn't happen. <laughs> so I was told to go and have a look at the neurological ward because that's where he'll be going next. So in my innocence as a 16 year old, I strutted up to that ward, hopeful that this ward was going to make all the difference. This was the next step to getting him home. But then as I walked those corridors of Ward 8, man, I received the shock of my life. Here was the reality of what a brain injury does. Now, do you remember me mentioning how I said my mum looked like she had the weight of the world on her shoulders? Well, little did she know that weight was about to get a hundred times heavier. So I want you to all take a minute and think of this weight that she's carrying. She is trying to deal with the emotional and mental trauma of my brother's injuries. She is worrying about my sister and I and her three moko. And then she has the financial burden of worrying about how she's going to pay for accommodation at the hospital, accommodation at the rehab, travel, food, living expenses, and then still trying to maintain her mortgage. And then you have this added weight of the health system. So I'm sure you're all well aware of how complex and intricate our health system can be. Like some people study years just trying to understand one little segment of it. So imagine a family navigating through this service, three months in hospital, five months in rehab, and now just over 12 years with 24 hour home based care. It's traumatic in itself to say the least. 
So three months after the accident, we made the journey to a rehab in Hamilton. Now, if I thought Ward 8 was a shock, then rehab was like an atomic bomb. Here we mixed with people who had sustained traumatic brain injuries right across the spectrum, from people in vegetative states to the more active. Like I remember trying to get to my brother's room and having to dodge people who were both sexually and physically abusive. It was scary. So we always made sure that we had at least one of us there with him at all times to make sure he was safe and well cared for. I remember one day when they tried to kick me out. So the social worker had approached me and told me that I had to leave after hours. And my mum and my sister were in Rotorua at the time working, I was there by myself. So I panicked, where was I meant to go? I was only 16. So I called my mum and she came straight up to sort it out. But after yet another battle for fighting for the quality of care for him, we finally decided to take him home. Now we thought home would lessen the load. But home was never going to be the same. Now let me paint this picture for you. So my brother is six foot three. He was 120 kilos at the time. Wheelchair bound, incontinent, hoist dependent, muscle spasms down the left side of his body and non-verbal. Now imagine taking someone like that home to a two bedroom granny flat. <laughs> it was a rough. <laughs> we had his bed in the lounge. Um, my mum slept next to him in the Lazy Boy every night. My cousin and I were in one little room and my sister and her three kids were in another room. When he would need a shower, we'd have to put him in his commode, wheel him across the gravel to the carport, wrapped in a sheet because we lived opposite a campground, and then shower him in a tapped off area underneath the solar shower. <laughs> It's funny now, it wasn't funny then. <laughs> now, you may be asking, why did you take him home then? Well, we didn't know what other option we had. He was being hit by another patient in the rehab when we weren't there. He was often left lying in his own feces for periods of time. And he was always left isolated in his room. We just wanted him to be safe. But caring for him at home had a whole new heap of challenges. It was like a grenade had been thrown in our front door and just blew up everything we called normal. We had brought a stranger home. He was a different person now. He wasn't the same brother that I had loved and respected for 16 years. Now, growing up, I was my brother's baby. I never really had the best relationship with my dad, but I always knew my brother would be there for me. He was my safe place when everything became overwhelming. So after that accident, it all changed. It's like the floor had been pulled out from under me. Now, I tried hardest to be strong for my family and to grow up and do everything that needed to be done. But that constant pressure of trying to be strong, trying to grow up, eventually took its toll on me. I was afraid that if I didn't step up, then I would lose my brother or maybe even lose my mum. So I eventually broke. When the pressure got too much, I would cut. At first there were little small ones with razor blades where no one could see. I knew that I needed help from someone but I also knew how much pressure my family was under, so I was definitely not about to speak up. And then one night it got really bad. I was home alone, it was quiet, and all I could do was think. I thought about the past, how my brother was a different person, how my mum was different, how much my sister was struggling, and I just felt so alone. I walked into the kitchen, opened the drawer and reached for the biggest butcher knife I could find and then just started cutting my arms. My clothes were covered in blood and I just laid on the kitchen floor. But I knew that I couldn't be selfish and do anything more than I had already done because it would hurt my family and I knew how much they had been through already. But I wasn't sure if I, was a, if I would be able to stop the next time. 
So that was the fear of the next time that made me realise that I needed to get help fast. I couldn't do that to my family. They had already been through enough. The thing is, we've never had the chance to process our feelings because we were constantly faced with so many battles. We have had to fight ACC, home-based care providers, OTs, physios, speech language therapists, GPs, specialists, home-based care, I mean, hospitals for ongoing treatment and support workers, the list goes on. We were constantly labelled as a difficult family. But all we ever wanted was a quality of life for Ray. Now tell me, are we difficult for expecting staff to be trained in toileting, showering and the basic care that you and I take for granted? Are we difficult for expecting my brother to be treated with dignity and respect and not just as a monetary value for providers funded by ACC? Are we difficult for expecting Ray to receive the same standard as care, same standard of care as any other able-bodied person in a hospital? Or should we have said that it was okay that he deserved a lesser standard because of his disability? Should we have accepted that providers allowed their support workers to talk about Ray and his confidential care? Would any of you be okay, okay hearing about your most private details from someone you've never met? To them, we may have been difficult, but it wasn't their loved one lying in a bed, vulnerable and helpless. We were his voice who fought for his quality of life. But every time we challenged them, they bullied us, threatened us and wore us down until we were nothing. They forced us as family members to work, even when we had other work commitments, uni commitments, when we were stressed, sick, they even tried to get my sister to work with her three kids and a newborn. If we didn't step up, they, we were always told that family needed to step up. But if we didn't, they wouldn't send anyone in, leaving us no choice but to drop everything and get to him. <sighs> they threatened, they often threatened that they would put him in an elderly home and withdraw their services. Now we did try new services, hoping that the next would be better, but time and time again we were let down. After eight years of this continuous treatment, it finally pushed my mum over the edge to the point where she became suicidal. My strong, independent mum had finally given up the fight for life, the fight for her whanau, and the fight for herself.
So tied up in a straight line And everywhere you turn There's vultures and thieves at your back The storm keeps on twisting Keep on building lies That you make up for all that you lack It don't make no And you know 
Now that little girl at the end of the video was Ray's daughter. She was four at the time of the accident. I have a vivid memory of her singing You Are My Sunshine to her daddy every day in ICU. Now she was too young to understand what had happened to her dad. Like, how do you even explain a traumatic brain injury to a four-year-old? Over the years, she never received any counselling or any help to understand her own feelings or the changes in her father. Like, we as her family didn't even understand our own feelings, let alone trying to help a little girl. Now, Ray had fortnight access to her, so he got her every fortnight weekend. And she always seemed like a bright little bubble, sweet, caring, and very protective of her daddy. Whenever he would get a new caregiver, she would just sit in the corner and stare at them, always making sure they were looking after him properly. Then one day, my mum and I were in the kitchen talking about camping and our Christmas break and how we could take Ray in the tent, when all of a sudden she broke. She was only 12 at the time. I looked down and noticed the scars on her arms and her legs. And then my heart broke. Had she been going through this all alone? How did I not see her before? It was like looking in the mirror for the first time. My beautiful niece, Ray's Reba's reason for living, had also been cutting. I remember having so many questions racing through my head, and then it all froze. Was this my fault? It was like our world had been shattered again. Now, it took me a while to realise that I'm not that 16-year-old anymore, and I could do something about it. A 10, 13, or 16-year-old child should never have to feel that way. In the past few years, I have met so many other children who were self-harming, self-destructing, and suicidal. I realised that it wasn't just us who felt this way. There were so many other families, well, there are so many other families and so many other children going through the same challenges. As people don't talk about the ripple effect, the ripple effect it has on families, the ripple effect that break each member one by one. If it wasn't for this beautiful lady, Shao Ray, and a spiritual healer who mended the broken pieces of our family, we would not be where we are today. And together, Shari and I have co-founded Camp Unity. It's a charitable trust, trust which brings vulnerable children together and a safe and secure place where they are free to be themselves. They never have to feel alone. We want to reach out to every <coughs> child and youth and let them know that they are not alone. So I've got one more video for you. Staring my reflection in the mirror Why am I doing this to myself? Losing my mind on a tiny era I nearly left the real me on the shelf No, 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 no Brushing my hair, do I look perfect? I forgot what to do to fit the mold The more I try, the less it's worth 
broken Cause everything inside me screams no, 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 no So every child in that video had been impacted by a head injury, either themselves, their siblings or one of their parents. So we brought them all together for our very first camp at Tui Ridge in Rotorua. Uh, we had about 32 kids there and 18 parents. We invited one parent per family to come along so we could get them meeting and greeting other parents who understood what they had been going through. And we ran a seminar on grieving for the living, um, grieving for yourself. And then we've done a lot of different activities with the kids to try and open them up and get them talking. And they all felt normal. This was their normal. No one was different at the camp. They were all OK to be themselves no matter what they were like. <coughs> so we do have another camp coming up on the 11th to the 13th of October this year. And that will be at Tui Ridge as well. So I would like you all to take a minute and think about the whānau and consumers going through your services right now. What can you do better to ensure that they don't go through what we have? How can you alleviate some of the burdens of the whānau so instead of fighting the system, they can focus on each other? How can we all work together to make a difference? Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Thank you.